Hi everyone, welcome to the Wool and Spinning Podcast. I'm Rachel, your host. I can be found everywhere as well for pearls. Um, I would like to welcome new watchers to the video cast. Um, thank you so much for giving my show a try. And if you're a returning watcher, thank you so much for coming back. Um, so August um, has ended up being kind of a crazy month. Um, and I've been doing a few things that I'm actually not allowed to share with you yet. Um, one of those things is going to be shared with you in September. I'm really sorry about the lawnmower. I've been waiting for them to finish and they haven't. So I'm hoping that they'll finish quickly. Um, so we'll just wait and find out. Um, yeah, so I've been working on a couple things that I'm actually not allowed to share with you. Um, but one of those things will be, um, part of the September episode. So that's kind of exciting. Uh, the other thing is going to be probably a long time before I can share with you what it was, but I'm excited for when I can. So, um, Spinzilla. I wanted to talk about that really quickly. Um, anybody who is interested in spinning for Spinzilla, um, that is the week of October. I'm going to look it up while I'm telling you other details. Um, Spinzilla is a week long event. Um, it is a, um, they call it the uh, a monster in spinning, uh, a monster of a spinning week. It is running this year, um, October 5th to the 11th. You basically, um, you can spin as a rogue spinner or you can spin on a team. I will be spinning with uh, Team Sweet Georgia and this is their third year. Uh, my friend Chrissy of the Snappy Stitches podcast, she's going to be uh, spinning with us as well and I'm hoping that my friend Diana will be spinning as well but I'm not sure. Um, so you can register as of September 1st. So that's why I am mentioning this because this show is going to come out on next weekend, uh, August, I guess that's the 30th. I'm hoping to publish the show. I'm recording this on Sunday, um, August 23rd, but there's a segment that I can't include because something hasn't come yet. How's that for a hanger, a cliffhanger? Um, and I'm, really hoping that I can include it in an August show. So this show is going to come out right at the end of the month and I knew that that would happen because of waiting for this um, uh, particular item to come in the mail. <laughs> it's coming via Canada Post and I think that's what the holdup is. Um, unfortunately Canada Post sometimes can be quite slow. Um, so unfortunately I'm still waiting. So. It is now the end of August and you need to decide if you're going to spin with Spinzilla for 2015. So um, you can register with a team and you can also register as a rogue spinner. I really recommend, I, I really encourage you to give it a try if you haven't done Spinzilla in the past. It's very different from Tour de Fleece. Um, Spinzilla is um, spin like heck for a week um, and you know count up your tally up your yardage plying counts it hasn't in previous years but last year is the first year that it counted uh, which is really great and because um, a lot of people like to finish an entire project during Spinzilla they'll spin for a sweater um, they'll spin for a lace weight shawl um, so you want to get that plied up and finished um, and have that count so that's really great um, so like I said, um, check out Spinzilla.org if you are interested in participating, but I wanted to put that plug in there for Spinzilla because it is coming up and it's coming up fast to uh, register. It is $10 to register and that money is goes towards uh, needle craft, needle arts and needle craft um, awareness and programming around the world. It's a global um, initiative. Um, just for interest sake, um, Spinzilla is presented by the National Needle Arts Association Spinning and Weaving Group. So they are, I'm pretty sure they're a non-profit organization. I'm not totally sure, but I'm, I'm like 90% positive. So Spinzilla, if you want to spin with us, um, please check out the Sweet Georgia group, um, on Ravelry and you can find all the details there. Um, Sprouts a.k.a. Grace. Oh shoot, I think it's Grace. Chrissy's sitting there correcting me right now, I can feel it. Anyways, she's our fearless leader and she's fantastic. She's really lovely. So, 
I'm feeling a little bit, um, I'm really tired and um, I know all parents are always saying that they're tired, but I'm actually not tired because of the kids. I'm tired because we were at a wedding last night and um, it was lovely. It was one of my very dear friends who I've um, known for 15 years. We met on the first day of nursing school. Um, we were both the youngest in the entire class and we sort of joined forces because we were still 18. Um, we weren't even of the legal drinking age, which in Canada is, or in BC is 19. Um, I think Alberta is 18. Anyways, um, so yeah, her and I were the youngest. Um, we were in a class with um, a lot of older students, people who are coming back after already doing another degree and then coming back and doing um, nursing as their career choice. And um, we joined, we just kind of teamed up and we're very, very different people. And yet we've always been able to find um, a lot of common ground. She's um, an amazing, um, fashion putting clothes together she's got just an amazing eye I think she should have been like an interior designer or something um, or like a, uh, you know a Saks Fifth Avenue um, like one of the girls one of the women that puts like outfits together for celebrities um, she just boggles my mind um, so her and um, her now husband Alex um, they got married last night and she was actually my maid of honor um, and so Mike and I were able to go to her wedding and they had a photo booth. Unfortunately, James got this and so he kind of wrecked it. So there's Mike and I. It was really fun. So that's why I'm so tired. <laughs> um, okay. Do you guys want to hear about some spinning? I think that's probably why you're here. So um, I have a finished object. I have some work, uh, one work in progress, and I have one that's just about ready to go on the needles, but I wanted to um, record first before I wound and skeined the yarn, because I wanted to talk about how I, how I spin for socks. Um, and I have a few things that I wanted to uh, share with you that are like project planning kind of things that are just hot off the wheel. So let's jump right into it. Um, finished objects. So this was I'll show you the the hand spun yarn first sorry for the banging so I finished this a while ago this was um, hedgehog fibers um, black alpaca merino black alpaca and sparkle blend it was a fiber club um, it was February's fiber club February of 2014 and this was one of those yarns that I, and I had double of the club, I had seconds. So I had 250 grams of this and I Navajo plied it to keep the colors together. And this was one of those uh, fibers that I kind of threw on the wheel because I really wanted to spin with alpaca and with an alpaca blend. But I didn't really know what it would turn into because the colors were quite, they were quite gregarious for lack of a better word. They were really bright. Um, they were quite, um, you know, talk about unapologetic color. They were bright and I do not wear brights. I wear a lot of neutrals. Um, I thought that I wore a lot of gray, but I want to talk about something later in the podcast night. I actually don't. Um, I wear a lot of blue, um, yellow. Um, I'm starting to wear green again, which I think is because of spinning. Um, I wear a lot of cream, white, um, I'm always in blue jeans, so whatever goes with jean. Um, so once I spun this up, with the um, black alpaca in it, it heathered really beautifully and it toned down all of that color that was in there. And um, I ended up just loving it. Like I loved the singles. Um, if this had been a singles yarn, I would have been really, really happy with it. So this was all that was left from my project. And the only reason why I have so much left is because um, I did um, quite a stretchy bind off and it takes a lot of yarn to do that. And I didn't want to wait, risk not um, having enough to bind off. And my um, rows were so long by then that I couldn't risk continuing on. Oh my goodness, I'm totally mixed up with the camera here. I'm really sorry. Okay, so this is it. So this is my own design. I um, totally did my own thing. 
Um, I basically started knitting. I did a huge garter tab. Sorry for that clinking. I did a really big garter tab at the top of the shawl, cast on five stitches, and um, I turned it and picked up along here, and then I started knitting, and I started in um, garter stitch, and I was going down in garter stitch, and I was actually going to continue in garter stitch because um, I really liked what I was getting, but then I got bored. So then I switched to stock connect stitch, which is in there. And then I decided that I didn't want strips of garter stitch, strips of an equal, equal sized strips of stock connect. I decided that I wanted um, smaller strips. I'm going to cough. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, I decided that I wanted it to be asymmetrical, so that's what I ended up with. And I also decided that I wanted my stockinette sections to get bigger. So that's what happened as well. And it just kind of keeps on going. So this is it. I'll just go slow and go across. So that's the big side, and then this is the, the small side. So I worked my short rows in the stockinette section so that I ended up with, um, you almost can't see them on this side, but they are there. There's another stockinette. Another. Um, Oh, I'm just completely mixed up with the camera today. I don't know what's going on. So that's in there. I love this, but it turned out really orange. And my hair is orange. So it's a lot of orange. But it also has the blue in it. So that's what it looks like when I wear it. I just really love this shawl. And um, it has lovely drape. So that's, I'm not going to keep it on because it's um, really warm out. But um, yeah, so that it was my hand spun hedgehog fibers. I don't think I said that. Hedgehog fibers, um, merino, black alpaca, sparkle blend. That was February 2014's Fiber Club. And um, I just love how, how it turned out. I, had, I have a blog post coming out. Um, soon um, uh, with detailing the details of that project um, and like I said it was kind of my own imagination um, like as I was knitting I was just kind of coming up with it um, I used um, Japanese short rows which are my favorite I'm really torn about whether or not I should write it up so if there's any interest in um, a recipe of how to knit this shawl please get in touch because um, if there's a few people that are interested I will write it up um, okay for the next thing I'm gonna pause the camera quickly because um, I'm just gonna get everything together and then I'll talk about it so uh, yeah one minute. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was works in progress. So this is a hand spun project that I cast on one evening when my mom was over and we were having tea and I was looking for something totally mindless and I was cruising through projects and patterns on Ravelry and nothing was really clicking and I felt like everything, this is so terrible, but I felt like everything was just too much knitting. I was like, it's just too much knitting. That's too long, that's too much, blah, blah, blah. And then I kind of thought, you know, everything is a lot of knitting. This is a quite fine gauged yarn. Um, I really want to show off the texture of it. I don't want a lot of pattern stitches. I'll get over that feeling of um, that it's too much knitting when I get into the project. And I think part of it, I was just feeling really tired and it was the end of the day and um, I just wasn't sure what I was really looking for. And then, Funnily, I stumbled on a new Pearl Soho pattern, and this is the um, diagram. 
so that it's called uh, folded squares cardigan and it looks like this and unfortunately I don't think that the photo really does it justice sorry for the reflection of our yard um, I think it unfortunately because she's wearing a shift dress and the cardigan doesn't have a lot of shape um, and just the way it's photographed and stuff I don't I don't think it really um, does it justice but basically um, you cast on um, up here so you cast on up along where the arrow is and you knit down and then you cast off and then you knit down so you end up with a T shape and then the sleeves are knit separately and you cast them on knit up and then do um, decreases on either side so you end up with it looks like a house kind of and then you sew them in and then you fold the whole thing on the dotted lines and um, it gives you sort of a shrug looking open front cardigan she got the um, inspiration from a Japanese uh, sewing book pattern sewing book um, let me see if I can find her right up here um, under the intriguing heading, quote, wearing a square, Nakamichi outlines a pattern for a cardigan that consists of a big T with its outer top corners folded inwards. Gears turning, I set out to try the template in knitted form using garter stitch and habu textiles incredible dyed bamboo. So I'm not using bamboo. <laughs> I am using my mini bats that I spun up during Tour de Fleece. I have over a thousand yards of this yarn in total. So these are, this is a little skein that's left and then I have this big monster skein. And I had two other um, smaller skeins that looked like this, but one of them is gone now, it's been used. And the other one I'm in the middle of knitting. So this is my other one. And this is what it's looking like. I'm knitting it on 3.5 uh, needles, which are US size fives. And it's just, um, has a lovely texture. I just realized I'm showing you the backside, but it's garter stitch, so it doesn't really matter. So it's very analogous. Um, it only, this yarn that I, that I, put through the drum carter I made mini bats I've talked about, I talked about this on a previous on last month's episode I'm pretty sure I talked about it in July so this yarn basically um, I used navy blue perindale uh, sage green merino uh, undyed natural BFL um, undyed natural cream alpaca undyed natural cream gray or no gray alpaca um, undyed natural black alpaca, um, Firestar, and then I also used some um, superwash merino that I wanted to get rid of that I, I just have scraps left of it, um, and it was yellow, and what else is in here? Oh, uh, some wool silk. It was a 50-50 wool silk blend that I bought at Fibers West in 2008 because actually I couldn't remember and I looked it up because it's all compressed and I had to really pull it apart and put it through the drum carter separately and then put it into the bats um, and it's got the this really really gentle coral in it but it's mostly um, very neutral um, a very neutral gray green color it looks like um Whenever I look at it, I think of um, tidal pools, but not the black slate rock that you get. Sometimes more like a, like a, uh, down on like um, in Washington, Whidbey Island, um, in and around Anacortes and um, uh, La Conner, um, Swinomish. Um, and we get them up here too, like in Tofino and um, 
out in Galliano, the tidal pools are really light colored and they're almost like gray and they almost have like a like a greeny um, algae kind of look to them and that's what that um, that silk wool looks like and it was um, a dyed by um, what were they called they were up in Kamloops she was a dyer um, anybody who's from this area knows exactly who I'm talking about they always ha used to have a booth at Fibers West and um, I think they had a booth at Knit City a couple last time they're from Kamloops um, I think I don't think she's dying anymore and I think she's actually decided to close down her shop and I know it had the word twisted in it twist of fate twisted fate twisted fate I think that's them anyways it was her stuff and it was from 2008 that I bought it and um, I kind of just want to use it up anyways I threw that in there as well so this is knitting up it's just really interesting lots of texture so I think from a distance like when you're wearing it it'll be kind of it'll kind of look like that so this is actually going to fill a hole in my wardrobe um, because I really wanted a cardigan that I could just pull on that was three quarter length sleeves um, that didn't have any buttons that um, I could um, I'm totally backwards today guys um, that I could wear with a um, white tank top or a blue tank top whichever worked and um, uh, I could just throw it on over top um, and um, if we we're going up to the park or if we go um, if we're going um, out to like top romp or something I just wanted something really um, kind of easy to wear easy to pull on and didn't looked nice but and had some texture and some interest but it wasn't um, uh, difficult to wear so I'm hoping that that'll fill that that hole in my wardrobe so that brings me to um, the capsule wardrobes. I am in the process very slowly of um, getting rid of a lot of my clothes and um, I'm paring down, I'm hoping eventually over this year from September 1st onward, so I'm starting September 1st, I'm actually hoping to get my wardrobe down to under 50 items and then when an item wears out, um, unless it's jeans, um, my goal is to make a replacement. Um, this doesn't include underwear, um, workout wear, sleepwear, um, socks, um, undergarments like um, tank tops, um, camisoles, that kind of stuff doesn't count any of that. And it doesn't count knitted items. So like sweaters don't count that I've knit, um, hand knit shawls don't count, um, any of that kind of stuff. So I'm really hoping that over the next year or two I can pare down my wardrobe to really classic items and then fill gaps with handmade clothing. So um, that's something that I'm, I've got a piece of hair like right here, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that that's something that I can work on. It will also be um, talked about here on the podcast and, and on my blog because it's a, it's a challenge. And then once I started getting rid of stuff and pulling stuff out, I haven't worn that in any year, it's out. I haven't worn that in six months, that's out. Um, it got easier and easier and easier and I found that I was getting more and more um, ruthless so um, so far I've actually been able to get rid of 50% of my wardrobe so and it's all stuff that I like haven't worn since James was born um, because my um, daily needs for clothing has just changed so really interesting stuff I'm really enjoying listening to Libby um, and reading her blog, um, she blogs at trulymyrtle.com. Um, I'm really looking forward to um, continuing on. I feel like I'm just starting my journey of making my handmade wa wardrobe, and she's sort of along the on the path and listening to what she says and learning from her experiences and making outfits. And um, yeah, so we'll be talking about that some more. And let's be let's be honest, a shawl goes with everything, right? So we. I'm just going to knit more shawls. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk about um, this spin that I just finished. This is um, Superwash BFL. Unfortunately, the color isn't quite right on the camera, and I'm not using my good camera today because um, we've been having a very challenging day with the toddler, with the three-year-old, my with James. And so... Um, I took advantage of being able to record my husband took 
um, him to the park. So this is a Superwash BFL. Um, it will be socks. Like I said, the color isn't quite right. It's got purples in it and um, like mauve. Uh, it's showing up as monochromatic here, but it's not. Um, so what I did with this was I stripped down the braid and I held, I, I kept stripping it down, stripping it down, and I, I divided it in half um, horizontally. So I had folded the braid in half and I broke it and that gave me my two skeins. And then each of those, um, I stripped down, stripped down, stripped down, like as much as I possibly could. And then I took two of those stripped down pieces and I held them together and I drafted from there. Um, so very high twist um, so that they be a little bit tougher for socks um, because there's no nylon in this and um, it ended up so I combination drafted basically so what ended up happening was in the yarn it ended up very heathered there's a lot of depth and texture it's very interesting um, I'm not gonna lie combination drafting is a little bit difficult it seems really easy when you first start out and you're thinking oh yeah this is no problem you know I'm holding my two little thin strips and go 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 but what ends up happening for me was I was getting quite a, and this is quite a dense yarn because you're drafting two fibers and they're twisting around each other and the fibers get compressed really quite quickly and easily and so when you're doing the short forward draft and you're smoothing back and then drafting forward and smoothing back. You end up with a, a slightly denser, heavier yarn because you're not adding any air. Um, and so I found this is particularly dense. Um, it'll be great for socks um, and I'm really looking forward to um, knitting it up next. So um, what I do when I'm spinning for socks is I divide the braid in half like I talked about I make sure that they're equal in weight and then I um, basically spin two separate skeins. So these went on to two separate bobbins and I spun um, both the singles for both bobbins and the bobbins were chalk or block full so on my um, Lendrum bobbins they were they were full. And then I waited one night because the singles were quite fine. So I waited, um, I spun on Monday and Tuesday night. So Monday night was the first bobbin, Tuesday night was the second bobbin. Cause I find short forward, I'm quite fast. Um, so it was about, probably about four hours of spinning in total. So two hours per two ounces approximately, maybe a bit more. And then I waited, sorry, Sunday night. And then Monday night was my second bobbin. And then Tuesday night, I plied them. So Tuesday night was, um, I made two center pull balls and then I applied them. So I applied one, wound it off the woolly winder, applied the second one, wound it off the woolly winder. So um, really happy with how this turned out and I can't wait to cast it on. So, hot off the wheel. Okay, this is a braid of um, BFL. Does that have any silk in it? I don't think so. It's just BFL. Um, this is by West Coast Carding and Color. Uh, this is by Lynn Anderson. So she's a local dyer. Um, she's a local fiber, um, local to Vancouver, British Columbia. I never said that at the beginning. Sorry about that. Um, she is a... Um, local kind of fiber um, person that many people who live in this area know. Um, this came out really beautifully. It's, um, I spun it fast. Um, it was on and off my wheel very quickly. Um, I spun it thick. This is probably, it's a light, um, light worsted, heavy, uh, very heavy DK. And I have, um, I actually can't remember how much I have it exactly. Um, I think that I ended up with enough for, um, I'm, I was gonna say I have enough for a striped cardigan for Nora, 
But I think that I do. I, I feel like this was less yardage than I was expecting, but more yardage than I was expecting because it was thicker spun than I had originally planned. And I had thought about leaving it as, oh, I haven't even done a project page for it yet on Ravelry. That's not like me. I must have just forgotten. Um, yeah, so I don't know what the yardage is of this. I'll have to, um, I'll have to recheck it. I know that I haven't washed it yet. That maybe is why I didn't do a project page yet because I haven't done photographs of it. I haven't washed it. I kind of just finished it and walked away. Um, it's very like lime yellowy, lime yellowy green. I don't know why I've been so drawn to these colors lately. Um, green is not my favorite color. Um, I get put in green a lot. Like people want to put me in green because my eyes are green. I have red hair. Um, it's a natural fit. And I think that I've been really drawn to green lately, partly because of um, my, that Shaylin hand spun shawl that I did. Um, I loved it so much and I have worn it so much that um, I think I just have been very drawn to the yellows and the, why well, the yellow is my favorite color, but to the greens and the greeny yellows and the greeny blues. And I love teal anyways. This was my Shaylin shawl. Just to give you, for those of you who haven't been around for a while, this was something that I, it's on my project page in Ravelry. Um, it was one of those projects, I couldn't stop knitting it. I couldn't stop spinning the fiber when I was spinning it. Um, I was obsessed with it for like, I think between the spinning and then the knitting, I think it was like two months and that's like all I wanted to do. Um, so yeah. Not my favorite colors, but I love it in the skein. I loved it in the braid. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with it. I was thinking a toque, but I have so many toques that like how many toques does one girl need? And um, I don't like knitting my hand spun into toques for other people because most of it's not super wash and um, I know it would get felted. So I'm very leery about doing that. I don't need fingerless mitts at this point. Although I don't have any, that's a good idea. For stroller walks and stuff, I could make some subway mitts and then they could fold over and close. That's not a bad idea because I just got a new rain jacket. I had to replace my old one and uh, with something longer and um, this would go beautifully with it because I bought a gray one. Mm, food for thought. The other thing too is it looks great uh, striped with, with cream. So I had kind of thought about maybe a cardigan for Nora and striping it with uh, cream because I'm trying to stash bust right now, but um, I'm not sold on the idea. I don't love the idea. What do you guys think? I'd love to hear from you. Um, I don't love the idea of knitting hand spun sweaters for the kids and I don't knit a lot for the kids. I don't know if you've noticed um, because I hate that they outgrow everything and I love the idea of um, sizing sweaters for bigger kids, knit the biggest size that you can, roll the sleeves, add to the hem later, that kind of stuff. Um, do a turned hem and just tack it so that when they get tall enough, you just undo the tacks and let down the hem of the sweater. I've seen a lot of people do that. Um, but for whatever reason, it still just makes me feel like it's a lot of work for not a lot of wear. But I think that's partly because we live in an area of the world where we don't wear a lot of wool sweaters. And it's not my knee-jerk reaction to grab that for the kids and put them in it. So I think that's part of it. So, I don't know. I don't know. The kids will always have hand-spun hand toques, but and mitts and gloves and stuff, but and Nora will have shawls as she gets older if she wants, and they'll always have scarves, but sweaters, I don't know, says the sweater knitter. This is hot off the wheel this morning. It is all kinked because I haven't washed it yet. It's still very active. Uh, so when I say active, I mean that it's still got a lot of twist in it and it's still very um, bouncy. Uh, let me show you. This is very controversial, by the way. Um, I have noticed that there's a real debate out there about, so this is what I mean by active. It's very active still. 
it's really um, twisty and turny and it's very like um, yeah active so there's a lot out there about active singles um, versus um, rested singles so you'll hear people talking about um, resting their singles on their bobbins for a while before they ply um, I mentioned that I do that with when I'm spinning for sock yarn because I tend to over twist my singles for sock yarn well that's James uh, and he's with um, his dad with with my husband they're playing out front they're camping um, <laughs> yes James um, so <laughs> so when you have really a lot of twist in your singles and a lot of twist in your yarns um, you end up with with very active um, there's a lot of twist in there right so a lot of people say that you should rest your stuff on your bobbins for a while before you ply or if you've plied it that you leave it before you wind it off onto your skein winder, your nitty naughty, whatever you're using to wind off your uh, yarn. I'm really torn about this. I get it. It's easier to work with rested singles and a rested yarn than it is to work with this. But where I get kind of lost or caught up is um, it doesn't change your finished product whether you work with active singles or not um, they're easier to deal with when they've been rested for sure and so I find for me personally um, if I that's where attention lazy Kate comes in handy and helps because you're um, I have a, an arched Kate and I also have a the Lendrum regular the regular Kate you know the one that sits like this where the bobbins are like this on it and there's a string that goes around around the back and they it holds them and you can adjust that to be as much or as little tension as you want or you can just take it off altogether so when you've rested your singles and they're not super active anymore and you can pull them off the bobbin and they don't twist back on themselves so this is a rested single it's not it's lost its twist um, it's lost its active twist it's very uh, easy they're really easy to work with great for beginners I would I would per personally I would rest my singles um, overnight if I was uh, or for a couple of nights um, and I did when I was a beginning spinner uh, it minimizes knots when you're doing a center pole ball for socks for example that's why I rest my sock singles um, the other thing, this piece of hair is driving me bonkers. Um, the other thing is, so it minimizes um, knots and twisting and that, um, but you still have to put the same amount of ply twist in to get the finished yarn that you want. So I think what ends up happening sometimes is when people have rested singles, and I was talking to somebody about this recently, so your singles are nice and rested, they're not super, super active. So they naturally kind of just ply together. And I think what ends up happening is you end up with like a lower, like you, you, you still have to put in the same amount of twist to get the finished yarn that you want. It doesn't mean that you're off the hook for putting in ply twist, okay? So this is obviously not enough twist, right? So you need, you still need to put in the same amount of twist to get the finished yarn that you want, rested singles or not. So that's why I don't care particularly if my singles are rested or not, because I'm still going to be putting in the same amount of ply twist. And I find when my singles are still quite active, I find it actually a little bit easier to do that per personally. And then if you pull it off of your bobbin right away, after you've plied and you end up with this really super active pile, this is going into water. You're going to snap it. When it comes out of the water, you're going to snap it like this and going around. You're going to go all the way around and snap, right? And some people, and I do this, 
I double it like this, I hold it double, and I smash it in the bathtub, and I smash it again to finish it. And then when I finish my smashing, I go like this. So I find where I've tied it, and I push it down like that, and it straightens out the skein and it gets it to hang really nicely, and then it dries. And so, if you've rested this for a while on your plied, on, and you've plied it and you've rested it, when you wind it off, it's definitely easier to work with. And I, I really like working with rusted plied yarn. But as soon as it hits water, it's going to go active again. And you're going to have it all go all crinkly again. I guess crinkly is the best word I can come up with right now. <laughs> so I would really encourage you to try both, you know, and, and fiddle around with it. See what you like. Because for me, I was really, really scared back when I first started spinning again. I was really scared to work with active stuff, and I was a little bit scared to pull it off my bobbins when it was still active and to ply with it, and I felt like I should rest it, and I should, should, should. And I was really surprised at how easy it was to work with when it wasn't really rested. So I would encourage you just to try. Like, just try some different stuff, and you'll find what you like, and, and read as much as you can, and you'll you'll find, um, you know, um, sort of what I call master spinners um, they have lots of really useful and helpful information about all of this I would really encourage you to read some stuff if you haven't already um, from Judith Mackenzie McEwen she's got some really great information about working with um, rested versus not rested singles and plied yarn and stuff it's really helpful and then just try stuff don't be afraid to sample and try so this yarn is um, a combo spin. I got 450 yards. Um, I spun it from the fold and so I took the yarn, or the fiber. This is some leftover that I haven't finished yet. So I took the fiber, it was like in its long braid, and I just kept breaking off staple lengths and then I held it over the over my finger and I spun it from the fold. So I spun it from here, from the tip of my finger. And I pointed my finger, <laughs> I'm going to point it right at you, uh, to the orifice of my wheel. And I spun it off the tip. And it creates like a cobweb on the end of your finger. It's really quite pretty, like that. And it comes off your tip like that. So it's a great way to add a lot of air to your yarns. And I had four ounces of Spunky Eclectic Polworth. And I have four ounces of Leading Men Fiber Arts Merino. And I knew when I got these that I was going to spin them as a combo together. Sorry, I'm just sorting out the fiber here. Because the colors were so analogous and they worked just beautifully together. So on the top is Leading Man Fiber Arts and on the bottom is the Spunky Eclectic Polworth. And Leading Man Fiber Arts was the Merino. So what I did was I divided up my fiber into three piles. I had one pile of merino, which was the leading man fiber arts. I had one pile of spunky eclectic polworth, and then I had one pile of 50-50 merino and polworth. And then for the one ply, it was uh, leading men. I have a whole bunch left on my bobbin, so this was my leading men fiber arts merino. And then I had, I'm just going to go chat with him and I'll be right back. Anytime I'm doing anything, <laughs> James wants my attention. As soon as I'm finished with all this, he, he's going to be off with dad. Like, oh yeah, mom, whatever. <laughs> it's not always the way. And this was the bobbin of Spunky Eclectic. So, oh, there's two butterflies um, right outside the window together. They're just fluttering around in, in the grass. Um, and then for the third bobbin, what I did was um, I took one staple length at a time of the Spunky, and I spun that. And then I took one staple length of the Leading Men Fiber Arts, and I spun that. And then Spunky, and then Leading Men, and then Spunky. So I ended up with um, an alternating um, bobbin. The Spunky Eclectic, the Polworth, it didn't spin as fine as the Merino. 
which is really good for me to file away for future for um, my own knowledge and my own like just to re remember they're both fine wools um, but it just didn't spin as fine um, it uh, is beautiful in terms of the finished product this is really um, indicative of what the whole skein looks like back here this is really what it looks like it's very sage green um, there's some hits of in the spunky skein in the spunky braid sorry there were some hits of um, there were some hits of oh it was like an orangey red it wasn't really red and it wasn't really orange and it came through in the braid in the craziest places so just really really pretty really interesting it's there too came through um, I'm kind of in love with this <laughs> can't you tell um, I'll show you a picture of the braids like when I when I, I, I had them together and I, I photographed them and then you can see what they looked like originally so that was that was the original uh, the two braids wrapped together so very um, I think they both complemented each other and they um, the cream and the red that was in the spunky which you can kind of see in the upper right corner there um, really brought some pizzazz and zing to the uh, leading man fiber arts which um, was had some really really dark spots and um, some really dark teal greens so I love how this turned out and like I said I got 450 yards so I'm sure on the tip of your tongues is what what are you gonna do with it so I'm really torn because I have these two skeins of three waters farm uh, one is Polworth is a Polworth Tussa Silk Falkland, sorry. One is 100% Falkland and one is a Merino Tussa Silk blend. So this is the Merino Tussa Silk and this is the Falkland. And as you can see, the colors are all very analogous. They all really complement each other really beautifully and they all have hints of each other in them without being exactly the same. These two are the most similar, the Merino and uh, Tessa Silk. Um, but this one is a little bit um, brighter. Um, and this is more muted and more, um, yeah, just more muted, more brown. It has a very yellow undertone and this, and it, makes this look bluer and um, a little bit limier but then this when you throw this one in it's darker and it just really adds a lot but then when you put these two together um, they're kind of perfect so because this is quite blue but it's a little bit darker but it has those same hits of coral in it so I was kind of thinking, and I'll see if I can find a good picture of it. I'm actually thinking about knitting a cameo. So the cameo starts off at the top with, um, it's, a, it's a shawl pattern. It starts off at the top with a darker color and it's a stockinette section and then it goes into a striping section. And then a solid eyelet pattern at the bottom. Uh, sorry, a lace eyelet pattern, but in a, in one in the one color at the bottom, and you can cast off the eyelet pattern whenever you are kind of done. You just keep going until you don't want to knit anymore. There was a really good picture of one of them that was finished. Here it is. That I thought would really show you the shawl. So I'm kind of tempted, and you can make the sections as big or as small as you want because they're not very, you know, you're just going from one section to the next. So I'm actually thinking very seriously about the dark brown. That would be the darker green, and then the um, that orangey color would be the 
spunky merino or spunky uh, leading men combo but I'm also thinking about the pattern the dogs are up on the counter uh, you try and do one thing and like everything falls apart does anybody ever feel like that um, sometimes you guys sometimes there's also the color affection shawl oh he's back and um, because I have the three skeins and it would use up all three skeins in like a monster shawl, I'm very tempted to look more at this pattern. So um, I wanted to share with you a little bit about the Merino and the Polworth and blending them together and, and spinning with them together. So I'm going to finish up with that really uh, th about this combo spin. Um, Polworth is from New Z is from Australia. They were developed there. Um, they were uh, developed by breeding Merino rams with Merino Lincoln ewes uh, with a goal of improving meat production while maintaining high quality fleeces until the crossbred, um, true, until the crossbred true to itself. So until they had the, the breed that they created until they were breeding together, um, and creating, you know, consistent polwars. Um, they are a conservation breed. Um, they are very even. They are soft feeling and lovely to work with. Um, they are not. They're not considered a beginner wool because they are so fine. But they're an easier introduction to the fine wools over merino. Oh, Charlotte decided to lay down like right on James's train, so I'm sorry for that noise. Um, it says that this is from the fleece and fiber source book. So Polworth uh, takes dyes beautifully. Um, it, you can spin it from the lock, you can flick it, you can comb it, which they recommend is a great choice, or you can card it if you have shorter fiber lengths. Um, so that's Polworth. And then for Merino, and Merino is a whole family of sheep. I think people think, and I know I thought this, that Merino was one sheep, one breed, That was that's Merino, They're that's who they are. But they're actually a family, and there's many different um, strains of merino and depending on which part of the world you, um, you're looking at there the merino sheep from those areas will be different um, so but merino is generally a fine wool uh, what well, is it is a fine wool um, But of course, the strain or type isn't often recorded for most merino that we come across in yarns or spinning fiber. So um, in this book, they do give you sort of a general um, fact sheet about merino, which I, I actually find very helpful. I've gone back to this page again and again and again, and I've got it um, bookmarked. Um, so merino, because it is a fine fleece, um, again, it is um, hard. It's, it's not a great beginner fiber. Um, when you try to, Merino wants to be spun fine. If you go for a thick yarn right off the bat, the wool will tend to draft in clumps. The ends of the fibers may not be secured well and not in, within the yarn and your fiber will be, your yarn will have a short lifespan and pronounced tendency to pill. To produce a thick yarn, spin several thin, nicely twisted strands and then ply them together. Um, you can spin from the lock, comb, or card, and because of its fineness, merino tends to form naps. Use your fine toothed combs, cotton carders, or a special fine fiber drumming cl uh, carding cloth on a drum carder. That's actually why I got a 125, mm, 120 TPI um, drum carder, uh, big drum uh, cloth, was because I do tend to lean more towards the fine fibers. And I knew that Merino often would go quite nappy on a 72 TPI. Um, not always, but you know, you, and you have to go really slow. And so I wanted to um, take that into account when I bought my 120 TPI. And I have 72 TPI hand cards. So I wanted something different because I didn't want to um, replicate my, the same tool. So. Because they're both fine fleeces, fine fibers, um, I thought that I would put, and they both like to be spun fine, so I thought they would be a great uh, fiber to put together, and I was right. They um, really complement each other well. I think if I were to do this again, and actually I do have two more braids that I want to combine, um, I think I might 
combine them by carding them together and then doing hand pulled roving. So that is something that I would like to work on this winter and I'm going to uh, talk about more on the podcast into the fall because um, rather than doing separate plies of, of separate um, of the different fibers, I'd really like to blend them up and work with them together. So I have a braid of um, Godiva, um, Godiva yarns and it's on 100% Falkland, and then I have a bra another braid of Leading Men on Merino that I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna card them together and then do hand-pulled roving. So I'll talk about that. Um, I found this quote this week, and I thought that I would finish off the show with it because it just totally speaks to how I've been feeling lately. Her groceries in the open plan kitchen, the brown paper bag, full of fresh, cool veg, fruit, and ice cream camera to close up as she spoons lazily to mouth have you seen this movie have you had this dream anyway that's who i want to be the lady at the start of every tv movie somehow financially secured aged under and about 32 eating chinese from a white box you know like they do i just thought that was so perfect this week i've been very much wanting to be (laughs) That woman who is very relaxed and standing at her kitchen counter, lazily spooning ice cream into her mouth. (laughs) So, we've come to the end of the show. Thank you so much for watching and for tuning in. Until next time, happy spinning.